as Chekha said, I'm at the Bennett Institute, which is when we're allowed back into our buildings across the way from the economics faculty, and we work very closely with them. Uh, but we're an inter interdisciplinary institute and um, really value the benefit we get from insights across the different disciplines. Uh, so I'm going to get on to COVID-19, but I want to start setting the scene by talking about why we are working on social capital to begin with. So there are three uh, sections to my brief talk today. One is about the relationship between trust as a measure of social capital and total factor productivity, so a macro approach. The other, the second is how do you measure this concept of social capital when it's multidimensional and usually captured by surveys with many questions. And I'll talk about how we've gone about that. And then I'll get on to some very recent work we've done and haven't yet written up looking at COVID-19 mutual aid groups and social capital. But let me start with the background and why we're interested in social capital anyway. We have a program um, called the Wealth Economy Program. And uh, you might ask, why do we measure, measure wealth or what the Office of National Statistics is calling in its work, the missing capitals? And one answer, uh, building on um, classic work by Parthadas Gupta here in Cambridge and uh, other well-known co-authors, including Ken Arrow, is because thinking about wealth takes you to sustainability because you're automatically thinking about future valuations and, and the path of assets over the, over the future. A second is that if you're thinking about measuring wealth, it takes you more towards thinking about economic welfare in terms of sense capabilities rather than utilities. And there's a long-standing debate that many of you will know a lot about, um, but was reflected recently relatively recently in the report by Joe Stiglitz and Marchesen and Jean-Paul Fritoussi uh, about how to measure um, economic performance and social progress. A report which was a manifestation of and a response to some quite widespread dissatisfaction with the way that GDP growth had become the only measure of progress that policymakers be using. And then the third point is that in economics, we talk about social capital in different ways all the time. We talk about the importance of institutions and economic development. We talk about the importance of goodwill on corporate balance sheets. We talk about the importance of weak ties and uh, linking people to the job market and helping them improve their lifetime prospects. But it's no good talking about these concepts if we don't really have a sense of how to measure them and model them. And so that was one of the inspirations of the program. And the link at the bottom of the slides, which I think will be posted afterwards, will take you to a description of our whole program. So let me start um, on the point about um, GDP, uh, about um, total factor productivity and trust. And you'll know well that uh, from the literature before, there's a, a strong positive correlation shown in the right-hand panel here between GDP per capita and trust. A high trust economy is usually a wealthy economy. Uh, we've also uh, got a diagram here on the left-hand panel of the relationship between total factor productivity and trust. There's a positive relationship there too, but you can see at a glance that there's much more variation between countries' performances in terms of total factor productivity. Why are we interested in that correlation? It's because if you're thinking at the macroeconomic level, the aggregate level, about what are the channels through which trust might contribute to positive economic outcomes, then thinking about its contribution to total factor productivity, a, a, a kind of good societal technology for organizing uh, production and allocation, it's natural to look at total factor productivity as a potential channel. But that variation that you see in the scatter plot is absolutely reflected in the relationships among different countries. And so here the red line uh, shows the measure of trust, generalized trust from the European Social Survey. The blue line shows the measures of total factor productivity, in this case from Penwell tables, but it's very similar using other measures. And again, you can see at a glance how different the uh, performances among some uh, European countries. So these are countries at a similar level of economic development, but very different profiles, both for the trust variable and also to some extent for the total factor productivity variable. So this shows you the different patterns across different countries, both in the trust variable and in the blue total factor productivity variable. And um, this suggests that if you try some econometric work looking for a relationship with trust and total factor productivity, you wouldn't obviously expect to find a significant relationship. However, we had a go. We um, 
tried a random effects panel estimation, as I don't have very long, I'm thankfully going to spare you the uh, details of how we did that, using a model from Pascal Escupta, one of the um, uh, pioneers of thinking about social capital in economic growth. And it turns out um, in the estimates, to which we subject to a lot of robustness tests, that the only significant variables apart from trust are the openness variables, openness to trade and inward um, foreign direct investment. Um, I should add that if you caught a glimpse of the scatter plot showing Ireland, Ireland is a, a, an outlier in many ways, which seems to be related to its um, extreme level of inward foreign direct investment and the way that it gets, that gets counted in the GDP and TFP figures. There was also a very distinctive uh, process of trust through the financial crisis for Ireland, which as everybody knows was particularly badly hit through the financial crisis. Um, the bottom line of the results is that if generalized trust goes up 10% as measured by this index, there's quite a big increase in the level of TFP, 1.8 to 2.9%. I'm making absolutely no claims about causality, because these are typical macroeconomic relationships where identification of causality is incredibly important. We don't have enough degrees of freedom to do that, and so we, we don't try. But that relationship seems pretty strong. So the second strand of the work then is to think about how you would measure social capital. I've been talking about the generalized trust response in the social surveys, but these surveys have 10 or more questions about different aspects of social capital. And like many concepts in social science, Social capital is quite a fuzzy concept with many potential dimensions. It's a bit like saying, uh, talking about somebody's size as a person, you might be talking about their height or their weight or the size of their shoes, but you've got some sense that somebody's a big person or a small person. So we tried um, applying principal components analysis to this, much more used in other social sciences than in economics. And um, doing so, we found applying to the European Social Survey about 50% of the total variation in survey question responses um, can be assigned to a component of generalized trust, the basic trust question. And then another 15% to a variable that links trust in people in an individual's network uh, to trust in institutions in general, how much do they trust society in general. So this is quite a high uh, proportion to be explained by a couple of principal components. It's been adopted in the UK by the Industrial Strategy Council and uh, this is the chart that they use. They show it for the UK relative to the European average and so you can see that sometimes we have been more generally trusting and sometimes less over recent years. In fact a little bit more during the financial crisis than other European countries. Um, and the people versus institutions, if this is positive, then it shows um, greater trust in individual networks than in uh, general institutions shown relative to the European average. So compared to that average in the UK, we tend to be more trusting of our individual networks than of institutions in general. So finally, on to the COVID-19 points. And um, we recently looked at um, self-help groups. There's um, many self-help groups are not registered, but some are and using the location, the postcode location that they um, put under the website where they register. We have uh, calculated how many groups are there um, relative to population around the UK. You can see that there's some dispersion. It's not exactly what you might expect. So for example, London doesn't show up as being particularly, um, uh, having particularly many of these groups, but other parts of the country, so up there in the Northwest and uh, areas of the west of England uh, look on this measure as though they've got higher social capital. So it's not a tight fit to population density. Um, we have um, done a little bit of work looking into this in more detail. There's a, a literature particularly in sociology looking at the importance of social capital during emergencies. A very well-known one is Eric Kleinenberg's work on the uh, 1995 heat wave in Chicago looking at the geographic distribution of excess deaths in different wards of the city and how that was linked to the different kinds of social networks that Hispanic families, African-American families had. Another example is cow on the Chinese famine. This is absolutely intuitive that in emergency when official responses are struggling to cope, 
then uh, social responses, uh, societal responses are really important. In the UK, the number of these groups registered ranges quite widely, um, 0.04 in, uh, or one and a quarter of a million to about 58 and a quarter of a million. And so the work we've done shows that there's a really strong positive correlation between um, that statistic measuring the number of groups and other measures of social, socioeconomic advantage. So it's correlated with education in particular, which stands out as being more important than income. So, but in general, it's um, affluent areas with highly educated populations, high incomes and older populations where you get more of these uh, self-help groups. And it's also correlated with other well-being measures like life satisfaction. So what this uh, says to me, and uh, this is something that we're continuing to work on, first of all, is that there's a real geography to social capital and talking about it in the macroeconomic context, as I did to start with, is important, but also particularly in the context of the UK government's levelling up agenda, thinking about the geography of it is important too. And then the other is that as we're finding through the pandemic, these aspects of inequality are actually uh, reinforcing each other. And so uh, inequality in uh, income or job access to jobs is not being offset by greater access to social capital or other assets. And all of these things are, are working together, which makes the levelling up challenge in the UK, but also in other countries like France and the US, where there are great divides, uh, even more challenging. So um, apologies for the technical hitches there. I just want to give credit finally to the team that's been working on this. And I will stop sharing my screen and hand over to Tiago. <laughs>